zero, okay, and obtain an equation that looks something like this, okay. If I set the left hand side to zero and then use this omega to define uh, what I have, okay. So I should have something like uh, something like minus omega imaginary of beta two one minus delta rho minus delta rho naught over t one. Okay, if I have one equation that comes out from there. Okay, and then I ask myself if this is going to become a constant and not change with time. Okay, this is the driving term of the equation. Okay, this is the driving term of the equation. It's going to be a constant of time. What would beta 2, 1 become? Beta 2, 1, if you solve this equation, is the first order ODE. You will have a homogeneous solution and a particular solution. The particular solution would be a constant of time, right? If I solve this equation now with this being a constant, you will have a particular solution which is also a constant of time. What happens to the homogeneous solution? The homogeneous solution is a solution without this term there. It is a decaying function of time because of this term. Okay, the homogeneous solution would decay away as time progresses. So only the driving term which gave rise to the particular solution would survive. So in long time, steady state limit, this also becomes zero because the homogeneous solution is not contributing. Okay. So I would also have a second equation being equal to zero okay, times i. I would define um, my delta omega, okay, beta 2, 1. And then I use my capital omega to redefine this term over here with the i capital omega delta rho minus beta 2, 1 divided by t2. So I have the second equation of motion that becomes something like that. But then what are the unknowns that I have in this equation? The unknowns that I have in this equation are delta rho and beta 2, 1. Those are the unknowns. Okay. Apparently, I still cannot solve the equation at this stage. So what I need to do is actually to break beta 2, 1 into a real part plus an imaginary part. Okay. And then I take the equation, the second equation, taking its real part and imaginary part. I will have an equation for, if I take its real part, I will have imaginary part coming out from here, real part coming out from here. If I take its real part, I will have an imaginary part coming out from here, a real part coming out from here. So I can get two equations out of the second equation. I can form two equations for these two quantities. Okay, I form that two equations out of the second equation, then I have three equations and three unknowns. My three unknowns will be this one, this one, and this one. And I can solve the three equations. And the equations are complicated to solve. And I will not go through the detail, but just tell you the answer. Okay? If you solve for the three unknowns using the three equations that follow from there. So you will have the difference in the population density will be the quiescent population density 
plus delta omega square, which is the difference in the exciting frequencies and the resonance frequency of the system, 1 plus delta omega square, okay, P2 square, this should be something like this in it, or capital omega square, P1, P2. It is delta of rho, and then you can get the solution for this two after solving the equation. Beta 2, 1 is equal to minus delta omega, capital omega, P2 squared, delta rho naught over 1 plus delta omega squared, P2 squared, 4 omega squared, P1, P2, and then you have the imaginary part of beta 2, 1. Okay? And that being equal to minus capital omega P2 delta rho not over 1 plus delta omega square P2 square plus 4 omega square P1 P2. Okay? So these are the four solutions that you can obtain by solving those equations. But let's look at the, some of the salient features of this four this uh, solutions over here. Okay. One of the things that you notice is that even though we have a perturbing field, we did not use perturbation theory to solve this problem approximately. We solve this problem as fully as possible. Okay. So E, E naught need not be a small quantity. E naught is just the amplitude of the exciting field. E naught translates to capital omega. Okay. Capital omega need not be a small quantity in this. Of course, if capital omega is in fact small, you can just throw out this term over here. But capital omega need not be small. And if you're close to resonance, okay, delta omega is defined to be that quantity over there. And if you're close to resonance, this term will disappear. Okay, this term will disappear. And you have something that uh, that peaks. Okay? If this is a function of frequency. All these quantities that we have are functions of the exciting frequencies. And if delta omega becomes zero, the thing peaks. Okay? If delta omega is zero, if this is in fact small, if this is in fact small, if delta omega is zero, the function peaks. So this actually defines something. The denominator causes the function to peak around omega equal to omega 2, 1. Okay, you can see that property over there. Okay? And then um, the other features that you could have from it, which is that um, This quantity, this quantity, okay, with delta omega being zero, is defined to be one plus four omega square p one p two. Okay, also defines the quantity of where the peak value is. If you have something with delta omega being zero, this peak value is proportional to one over four omega square p one p two. Okay, that's what this function is. So if you observe some properties of this uh, atomic system, like a dielectric constant, like absorption and like permittivity function peaks and so on, okay, you will observe that this peak is actually a function of omega squared. Omega squared being the exciting electric field squared, okay. So you can change the peak value that you observe in the response of the system to a laser light by studying this quantity. And you can write this quantity as being equal to 1 plus the intensity divided by the 
saturation intensity. So if you have I been the saturation intensity, then this been something that has been uh, dropped by a factor of two. Okay, so this is half. And then for other values, okay, you can actually get the the value of the response to go up. Okay, so you can actually control this peak value by controlling the strength of the electric field and move this saturation intensity back and forth, and hence change these three observable quantities uh, experimentally. And it turns out that those observable quantities can be related to the permittivity response of the system. I will not go into the detail. You can read the lecture notes as to how you relate these three quantities to the permittivity response of the system. Okay. So those are some of the salient features. So are there any questions regarding this? I will not go into some of the details that is done in the lecture notes. Like I can relate this to chi if I define this. For instance, if I were to define P, the polarization density being equal to a kind factor times the electric field phase or okay, where I can write the uh, chi being equal to I prime plus I double uh, I uh, double prime. I can actually relate this chi prime and chi to all these quantities I have here is done in the lecture notes. I will not go through that. And then you can actually observe this experiment as to where the peak should be. Okay, you can plot this as a function of frequency as well. Are there any questions regarding this? Uh, the study of this uh, two-level system uh, using the density matrix method. The good thing about this is that you can study this case even under the high intensity laser case. Okay, there's no perturbation theory in use. When the high intensity laser is used, omega becomes larger, and you have this saturation intensity that you can see over there. Okay? Are there any questions regarding this? If not, let's take a five minutes uh, break, and then we we'll come back to, to study chapter, chapter 11, I think.